This is Duke University. Dan, as most of you know, is a world expert on transportation technology, um, fuel efficiency, uh, modeling, and a number of other things. He's a professor at UC Davis, Civil Engineering and Environmental Science and Policy. He directs, he, he wears so many hats, we'll just uh, we'll take a few of them off and describe them. He directs UC Davis's Energy Efficiency Center um, and uh, the Institute of Transportation Studies, as you see up here. He more recently has a political appointment as a board member of California's Air Resources Board and the ARB, I think he'll talk about today, is uh, taking up an, an increasing amount of his time, really, really interesting work and important work. And then uh, you can also see his visiting scholar parts uh, up there. He's testified more before Congress many times. He's written uh, uh, many books, including a recent one called Two Billion Cars that some of you may have heard about or read. So it's really a treat for us to have Dan here today. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Rob. It really, I was just saying to someone, I really feel like a kid in a candy store coming here. I was reading through a lot of bios of many of you that are affiliated with the Institute. And it's so exciting. You know, probably it's one of two or three places in the country that have so much expertise in climate policy. Maybe resources for the future, and you all, and I don't know anyone else that probably comes close. And you would probably have more than RFF now, right? Since you take some of them from RFF here. <laughs> um, so I really, you know, I really am very excited. So I'm going to talk about, well, you see my subheading there. And, and that's also part of the reason we're excited about being here. It's, and I think that's what many of us here are trying to do, is somehow bring science to the policy process and figure out how to make that work. And with the climate world, it's really a challenge, as we all know. And so I've kind of brought the science and how I'll try to bring it together. And then I've just become really more and more focused on the policy part of it. You know, there's some people that are out there doing the advocacy with the different interest groups, but I'm really interested in getting the policy right, figuring out the right policy mechanisms. How do we get from here to there? And I don't even worry about the there's any the there anymore. It's how do we start moving in that in the right direction? So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about. I guess there's I two themes I'm going to mention. In One is talking about the policy process, and the other is about transforming transportation. So how do you bring those two together and, and put it in the larger context of climate policy and energy policy? So let me, I have a bunch of slides. And let me say that let's have questions along the way that um, are more, you know, to explain things. Because there's a lot of complications and many layers below every slide here. So if you have questions, uh, let's have a conversation. So, you know, just a little bit at UC Davis. Uh, the Institute of Transportation Studies, which is the main thing I head up. Um, and we have a program where it's focused on uh, bringing the policy and the technology people together and trying to uh, elevate. You know, we always talk about interdisciplinary. And of course, the Nicholas School here is a good example of it. And this, you know, our program with transportation is another way of doing it. So I'm, I'm a, that's one of the things I'm a proselytizer of. Is figuring out how to, how to reform the university to become more relevant. And these are a bunch of other centers that we have. Um, at, at TS. So this is what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about carbon policies and strategies, and how it all fits together, and what, we, what we've learned, how we move it forward, what's relevant to the US or even beyond that. And of course, I've got to Know, promote, shamelessly promote my book just a little bit. But it does set the, uh, frame the discussion here, because, you know, it was titled as Two Billion Cars and David, David Gordon. But this graph, at least for the transportation world, is really a key one to appreciate. And it's partly that these numbers are so big. These are the number of billions of vehicles in the world. We're a little over one billion. We'll probably get two billion. 10 years or so, vehicles in the world. They're not all cars, but all these other things, they take up space, they use energy, they emit carbon, and so they're all part of it. But the most important part of this curve, of this graph, is the slope of that curve. You don't see many slopes you know, in the world of, of, of 
major energy consuming technologies or sectors that look like this. And, but that's where we are. And with a very steep zone. We don't do something. If we think we have an oil problem now, we think we have a climate problem, it's only going to get a lot worse unless we do something. And do something pretty major. So I'm going to focus on transportation. Um, to make it simple, or at least to frame it in a more simple way, I like to describe it as being a three-legged stool. You've got the vehicles, you've got the fuels, and you've got the mobility, the users, us. So those are the three legs. And one of the uh, points about this is, or kind of an overarching observation is, that as we look at the, the vehicles, the fuels, and the mobility, um, by far, in terms of by far in terms of reducing oil use and reducing greenhouse gases, by far the most promising strategy is focusing on the vehicle technology, at least for the next 20 years or so. And I say that both in terms of technology opportunities and innovation, and in terms of the policy. So we're making great progress on the technology. The, the car industry is very focused on on innovation and uh, greatly improving the efficiency of vehicles. They're putting most of their R&D into that right now. <coughs> and I'll describe a little. They've already agreed to make these changes in a policy context as well. And so the policy is also, uh, I mean, the, the changes being made in the policy, the aggressiveness of the policies and for vehicles, the fuel economy standards, and greenhouse gas standards with vehicles, are just extraordinary. The, the, the progress that's being made there. In fact, it's by far, I would argue, it's by far the most important uh, policy adoption, policy implementation by the Obama administration, you know, through the whole administration. There's nothing even comes close in terms of its impact on energy use and greenhouse gases. And if you want to argue with me, I'll be interested to hear what that might be. <laughs> so the vehicle, the fuels part of it, there's policy, there's initiatives, but the technology is moving slower and the policy is moving slower. And so that's why this is a smaller uh, blob here in terms of what's possible and likely. And then the mobility process policies, the vehicle miles travel reductions are the most challenging and most difficult. So I'll talk about all three of them. It's a, I think it's a chiropractor to the back of the slide, which is, you know, is, for example, is mobility down there, particularly on the quantity produced thing, because it's simply not that feasible, or it's just really, one can't even imagine if it was feasible that there's mobility policies that could lead to significant impact. Is, might, is it kind of down there because it's really a combination of the feasibility and the quantity, or it's, is it, is it's it both. It, it is both because I think there are policy, and I'll talk about the leadership California is taking with a law that starts reducing vehicle use. Um, but even the reductions there are relatively modest compared to the targets that we're looking at with fuels and vehicles. So, and the reason for that is the policy is hard because there's a perception that um, Americans have a right to drive. <laughs> you know, frankly. And so working against that is difficult. And a lot of the institutions, land use, sprawl, work against it also. And the transportation sector is in many ways the most, the least innovative sector in our economy in terms of bringing information technologies and other things to transform how we travel. So you put it all together and it's, it's really tough. Even though many argue with me that it's the most important, and in many ways it could be, because, but they're all these co-benefits. So that's kind of a discussion we'll get into is we have carbon policy and to some extent carbon policy is um, at least in some places provides a framework, certainly in California, European Union, other places, is providing the framework for us to move forward in terms of innovation and change and behavior and so on. Um, but it's, in some cases those policies do lead directly to large benefits in carbon reduction, such as the vehicle standards. But on the mobility side, the greatest benefits would come in other ways. You know, creating healthier cities, 
reducing infrastructure costs for cities. And so it's kind of an interesting way of thinking about it, you know, for all of us policy wonks and policy nerds to get into this is figuring out how does this policy relate to other policies and other goals and to what extent do we ride this horse? <laughs> is this a horse we can ride that's going to get us forward as opposed to other horses? So these are the vehicles, so this is the vehicle story. So these are the fuel economy of vehicles for 20, 25 years was completely flat in this country. It's, it, in some ways it's really shocking that we let that happen. And in fact, it was this curve here in my frustration with the auto industry and the Detroit companies in particular that led me to write that two million car book. I was so irritated and frustrated <laughs> that I felt like, you know, someone needed to talk about what was really going on. But as I started writing it, as I said, all of a sudden the innovation started happening in the industry and policy started happening and so it became less of a kind of pressing uh, need or goal to focus so much on that. But anyway, so you see it's pretty flat. And then in uh, uh, 2007, Congress adopted uh, more aggressive rules. And it was, as I'll point out, California actually started the process. In 2002, California passed a law that said that the vehicles had, the greenhouse gas emissions had to be improved. Now, California doesn't have authority to do energy uh, efficiency of vehicles. And so therefore, you know, partly what you'll see here is California working in certain constraints, but it can do greenhouse gases, or at least ultimately the Supreme Court said it can. And so California started back in 2002 with a law and got caught up in all kinds of lawsuits and the car industry fought it. And actually, the car industry ended up losing all of the lawsuits. Uh, but then the, the Bush administration wouldn't let California administer the law, implement it, so California sued EPA. <laughs> So it was kind of a uh, messy process. But in the end, when President Obama came in, he embraced, well, the 2007 law were, were adopted to start increasing the fuel economy. And then when uh, Obama came in, he not only accepted the California standards, but said, I'm going to take, I'm going to allow now in California to, to implement them, but I'm going to take them national. So it'll apply to the whole country. And now, and then I'll talk about what's happening now as well. So part of this story, you know, this is what frustrated me and led me to write that book is, this is a picture some of you might remember, Magnum P.I., Tom <laughs> Selleck. Uh, he, he drove this really hot Ferrari, went from zero to 60 in 7.3 seconds. This was really, you know, what every teenage, red-blooded teenage boy wanted, <laughs> you know, and a lot of others. Well, nowadays you can get an SUV <laughs> that weighs a lot more, that gets as good, and in many cases even much better performance, acceleration than that hot Ferrari did 20 years before. And so you know, the question is, how much power, how much size do we really need? And part of this is uh, you know, that question underlies a lot of the policy that we're adopting as we move forward. So, one of the extraordinary um, <coughs> events in Washington, one of the most extraordinary was when the Obama administration convinced the car companies to embrace very aggressive new standards on vehicles. The standards are 54, you know, well, I'll get into what it really means, but uh, 54 miles per gallon for cars uh, and trucks, and light trucks, by 2025. Now, you know, you saw that flat line for 20 years, and now all of a sudden we're going crazy, you know, with this slope that's very aggressive. And they got, you know, the White House got the car companies, all but two car companies, to buy into it and embrace that proposal, you know, two that weren't our Volkswagen and Daimler, and it was only because they didn't reach out to those two companies that give them some little goodies to make them happy. But all the other companies, the Japanese car companies, the U.S. car companies, all bought in. Here they all are, you know, sitting there smiling. Uh, so, I mean, that was really an, ex an extraordinary event. 
And for those of you interested in it, I'm going to leave this, you know, I'll leave this and you can look at this slide. Uh, but this describes what exactly they all agreed to. And I say negotiated by Ron Bloom. So Ron Bloom was this guy working for, in the White House for uh, President Obama. He was, he negotiated a lot of the bailout of the car, the car companies, GM and Chrysler, when that whole, and so then uh, President Obama brought him back and said, okay, we're we'll up on this, you know, cafe, greenhouse gas standards. And this guy, I mean, it's extraordinary. I, you know, because I was involved in, on the edge of this, and certainly very knowledgeable about it. Six months ago, I would have said, impossible, you could ever get the car companies to agree on it. In fact, I was getting in trouble with all my NGO friends who said, you know, come on, get up, get to the program. <laughs> we're pushing this 54 mile per gallon, and you're poo-pooing it that it's not possible. And he pulled it off. And so this guy, it was an extraordinary uh, way how, you know, I'm kind of learned being, being, I'm in Sacramento, so I'm kind of a, a smaller playground than Washington, but really seeing how these policy and politics things done. He sat there and he just said, okay, I don't trust any of them. They're all lying to me. And I'm going to sit down and I'm going to figure out how, where's the first company I can get to buy into this. And he picked Ford for various reasons he thought they would be the most likely of all the car companies. And he came up with some little uh, side deals with them where they would buy into it, and he got them. And then he just went down the list. And for every company, he gave them something. And so that's, when you look down this, you could actually assign uh, a car company or two car companies to every one of those little, you know, special carve-outs that were done for the car industry. So the, for the top is just what the actual agreement is. But then there was for the full-size pickup trucks, and that, of course, is mostly Chrysler and GM and to some extent Ford. You know, those are the little deals that were given to them that, you know, if you sell pickup trucks that have a mild hybrid technology in it, you can get 10 grams per mile credit. You know, that, and, and so, and then if you have strong hybrid, meaning a big battery in it, then you get more credits. So you see that went through air conditioning, you get credits, E85, you get credits. And then they came up with all these other little things. Grill shutters, you know, it's like on the front of the car, if you're going at high speed, you know, it'll, it'll uh, close in a way that allows the aerodynamics to improve, so it improves fuel consumption, so it's electronically uh, controlled. Solar roof panels, so all of these things, if you do any of these things on your cars or trucks, you get bonus points. And so in the end, you might, if you're a real cynic, you'd say, man, this is real sausage making at its worst in Washington. But then if you look more deeply, you realize that almost all of these were done in a very clever way, that they have very short time spans, they're very selective, they have caps on them in different kinds of ways. And so in the end, I mean, it's not really 54 miles per gallon, it's, you know, when you take into account actually how they're really driven and all these credits, it's probably more like 40 miles per gallon. But 40 miles per gallon is extraordinary when you're at 22 or 23 now. So this is kind of the behind the scenes process that took place, all these little deals. You know, this one guy who's, you know, I've come to respect as, you know, the supreme negotiator, and he's worked for United Steel Workers and worked on Wall Street, so this is a guy, uh, do you know him at all, Richard? Yeah, so I did a couple of briefings to him. You know, this is a, one of the brilliant negotiators that you definitely want on your side if, if you're ever doing anything important. Um, and so, and then there was another, oh, and so and then there were more things dealing with electric vehicles, and so like electric vehicles, for instance, they count as zero grams per mile, which is, of course, wrong. You know, this is where the scientist in us comes out and, you know, our stomach starts, you know, getting all tied up in ulcers and so on, is that it counts as zero grams. And not only does it count as zero grams, you know, which means you're ignoring all those emissions from the coal plants and so on, but they count as double as two vehicles. And that multiplier drops down to 1.5 in 2021, and plug-in hybrids. Does everyone know... You know, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, PHEVs just you know, say something. Uh, 
So anyway, so all this. And then, um, so California is going to, so California was part of the negotiation. And California, in many ways, kept their feet to the fire on all this, because California kept saying, if you don't agree you know, to the car companies and to Bloom, if you don't get it at this level that we want, then we're going to go our own way. And the car industry was just apoplectic about that, you know, because they want one standard, and that was their position. And so California kept threatening, you know, we were not going to go along with the deal unless it was pretty aggressive. So it kept the feet to the fire. But the one piece of it that many of us are a little queasy about is this last one is that, so California has a zero emission vehicle requirement, but the, one of the deals they negotiated was that if you over comply with the greenhouse gas requirement, then you can take those extra credits that you generate and use them to cut your zero emission vehicle requirement in half for California. And others, there's about 10 other states that also have the zero emission vehicle requirement. So the NGO, this is actually going to be the sink. So we're, California, the Air Resources Board, my board, is going to be adopting these standards in January. The feds are going to take, you know, they're much slower in Washington about these things. So they'll be adopting it late summer probably. Um, and that's also by us adopting it. It keeps the feet to the fire of, you know, Washington. Um, but so all those standards, and, and, and so we're going to be adopting new pollutant standards, criteria pollutant standards for vehicles. We're going to be adopting these greenhouse gas standards for vehicles. And we're going to be adopting a new zero emission vehicle program. It looks like the most controversial item on the whole agenda is going to be this zero emission vehicle requirement. And this little thing here is going to be you know, one of the real controversies because the NGOs don't like it. But Mary Nichols, who's the chair, made a deal with her to do this. So we'll and we talk if anyone's interested in more of the back room stuff. I'll tell you more about that. Um, one of the interesting part of the vehicle standards is, and this is thinking through, again, the role of policy and technology and how it's all come together, is this is an analysis that was done by EPA and DOT and, and California commissioned about what, can, what do you have to do to meet those 2025 20, 54 mile per gallon requirements. What technology, what innovation do you need? And what's, and so th this is um, one of the scenarios. And so what it says is the vehicles would be, the weight of the vehicles would be reduced 20%, you know, using lightweight materials and new designs. There'd be advanced engines, that means gasoline direct injection and some other things like that. Um, hybrids would constitute between you know, 20 and 40 percent of the mix in 2025. But you would only need, you wouldn't, basically wouldn't need any electric vehicles in 2025 to meet those very aggressive standards. Now that's an extraordinary finding because it tells us that with conventional vehicles, there's a tremendous amount of innovation going on. And, and the car company, you know, and this is the reason the car companies agreed to it, is because they have this technology in the pipeline that they're working on. And so they, because they don't really want to go to electric vehicles. Electric vehicles are more expensive, it's more complicated, they don't know how to sell them. Um, they're nervous about them, they know eventually they're going to do it, but, you know, the more they can put it off, the better. As a generalization, there are some, like Nissan, you know, that have taken a different position. But the point of this is that, um, conventional technology can get us a long ways with vehicles, improvements in the, in the transmissions and the engines, lightweight materials. So, but then you do get to the question, okay, we, if we really are serious about large reductions in, in oil consumption, especially greenhouse gases, if we're going to talk from 60 to 80 percent, then we've got to do something beyond gasoline engines. We've got to move to these electric drive vehicles, especially battery electric, plug-in hybrids, fuel cells. So somehow we've got to start on that process. And it's very controversial. How fast do we move? How do we make sure we move ahead? And so um, here's kind of the set of policies that are in place now to kind of push us into that advanced technology. So there's the California Zero Emission Vehicle Requirement, which says every car company selling cars in California 
a certain percentage of them have to be zero emission. And then, as I just explained to you in the vehicle standards, you know, the electric vehicles are kind of zero grams and double counted. And then there's rebates. So in California, there's a rebate right now of $2,500 per vehicle for electric. And, and, and the feds are giving a $7,500 per vehicle subsidy. So, you know, it's, it's pretty substantial. And then there's other incentive subsidies for charging stations and so on. <clears throat> so, you know, in many ways, there is a pretty serious commitment to electric vehicles. And, <clears throat> you know, many get nervous, you know, is it too much, too soon, especially given that, given that previous slide. But, um, and any, any anecdotal pickup from the, the auto industry on these, like the, besides Nissan, GM, people are thinking about expanding EV past the 1% level? Because, of course, you go back to the slide, if you get over, over performance in the EV side, then the rest of it becomes easier. Right. Is there right. Any, anything anecdotal from this in terms of this beyond Nissan and GM if, if, if some of the car companies are picking up on the incentives? Or? Um, well, certainly. Nissan is by far the most aggressive. Right. I think, and then GM's doing its Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid. The other companies, I'd say every single car company has an electric vehicle program and a, and a program to start selling electric vehicles in the next two to three years. But I think they're all, uh, most of them are very nervous about it. It's probably... And in fact, that overcompliance, that was for two companies. And it's probably interesting who those two companies are. That's Honda and Hyundai. And Honda is kind of a surprising one because Honda has always been, at ARB, you know, we, in the regulatory world, you're always trying to pick one, whenever you're doing a new regulation, you want to find at least one company that's going to support you on it. You don't want to go out there and have, you know, the industry, you know, in lockstep working against you. And Honda was always the company you could count on for environmental regulations. So it's kind of interesting with electric vehicles, they're on the other side of the fence because they've kind of messed up with batteries. They've had a lot of problems with batteries. And so they've been very uh, reluctant to go the battery EV route. And so they've invested in fuel cell vehicles mostly, but they're not quite ready to make a big push there. So they've been the most aggressive uh, fighters against the ZEV program. And, and at the same time, they also have the most efficient technology. So therefore, they're the ones that are going to benefit from that overcompliance. They're going to overcomply and they're going to be able to reduce their ZEV requirement. So this is the California kind of view. Of, this is one of the scenarios that ARB put together on what do we need to do to end up with 80% reduction in 2050 in the transportation sector. And what you see there is gasoline vehicles and diesel. You know, that's, <laughs> that's them right here. Pretty much gone. And, or pure gasoline. So then you have the hybrid vehicles, but they're pretty small also. And then you have the plug-in hybrids, battery EVs, and fuel cells accounting for, well, um, just battery EVs and fuel cells accounting for 80%, and that's another 10%, so about 90% is coming from electricity or hydrogen. Uh, for this, it would be for the new vehicles. But then it's hydrogen and fuel cell vehicles. Yeah, it's all hydrogen. For the fuel, when I say fuel cell, it's hydrogen. In California, so that's another little kind of sub theme that's kind of interesting because California continues to be committed uh, to believing that fuel cells are central to creating a sustainable transportation sector, that uh, fuel, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, you can't do it without hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. They might not be you know, as dominant as this, but they have to be a big part of it. And in Washington, well, especially at DOE, they've gone exactly in the other route. Steve Chu, for a variety of reasons, he surrounded himself. It was kind of coincidental, I think, the, kind of, the people that just happened to be appointed some of the senior positions all were very skeptical of fuel cell and hydrogen, and so they all ended up in one place at that one time, and it ended up creating a policy very hostile to uh, hydrogen. Um, 
the specific you know, the technology that one, can you describe really quickly how fuel cell you know vehicles work, what they're kind of what they're powered by, and, and mostly I mean I've heard a lot about the. I guess this would reflect why some people are really strongly in favor of them, some of them are opposed, but you know, it's just some te technological roadblocks or maybe they're more economic roadblocks to widespread adoption. So what it is, what a fuel cell is, is a device that converts hydrogen into electricity. No moving parts, no emissions, um, pretty elegant very, and very efficient. And so essentially you end up with, it's an electric vehicle because you still run electric motors, but instead of having a battery on board, you're, you're carrying hydrogen on board. And it's a gas, and so you have some challenge in uh, carrying the gas. You have to either compress it or liquefy it uh, or solidify it. Um, and there's some challenges with that. But I, I would characterize the, or the car companies as believing that fuel cells probably have more potential than battery electric vehicles. They tend to think that the technology is more promising that with batteries, and I'll have a couple of slides on it, the batteries are inherently expensive, inherently bulky, inherently low energy density, whereas with hydrogen fuel cells you can make a vehicle that has long range, can be essentially uh, a technical fix from a consumer perspective. So you gas it up, similar to how you do it now, similar amount of time, similar range, similar performance. So the car companies tend to, um, they used to think it was by far preferable to electric vehicles, but now with the Obama administration pushing so hard and others, you know, there's a little more, um, you know, a little less resoluteness on this. Um, economics, well, I'll show you a slide on economics. So, so that's the basic story on it. The real problem with hydrogen, you know, George Bush said, I mean, George Bush endorsed hydrogen fuel cell. He, you know, he thought that was the way to go. And in the early 2000s, that was almost the unanimous feeling of the European Union. You know, a lot of people. Um, the rats kind of eroded away. I guess this is kind of a related question. Of course, I'm looking at the distribution of vehicles you have up there. Sort of, you know, everything in transportation seems to have now been more corner solutions, or maybe I'm just fixated on the fact that internal combustion engine has been it for pretty much the history. So, I mean, can you envision a future in which, you know, like a third of the market is uh, fuel cell vehicles and a third are plug-in hybrid or plug-in electric vehicles? Anyway, that, you know where I'm at with that. Yeah, I can. Who can? Actually, I had an interesting exercise. Maybe I'll come back to it. I mean, as opposed to having one be totally dominant, is that what you're Yeah, saying? I mean, I don't mean just, you know, 100%, but, you know, pretty much, like, I mean, Vehicle technology struck me, and I'm so far from being an expert in this, but you know they just sort of sort of gravitate towards the dominant technology, and and that's right, and that's exactly the right question: is are we always going to? Are there reasons? Um, and people that think about technological systems, you know, there's whole literatures on this, and is there a reason that one technology will dominate? And I tend to think that in a particular region one technology will probably dominate, whether it's biofuels or electricity or hydrogen. Um, but it would be by region. So in the Midwest, there will be a lot of biofuels. In places where you have uh, low carbon electricity, you'll have more electric vehicles and so on. So, you know, there's infrared. The problem with hydrogen fuel cells was what really um, undermined them was that you have to, with hydrogen fuel cells, you have to transform the energy system and the vehicle system. You have to transform the oil industry, and so, you know, at least the downstream part of it, and the vehicle industry at the same time. And we are not good at that. We as a society are not good at it. So electric vehicles, so people backed off and said, well, electric vehicles, we don't have to do the electricity side of it. You know, we've got to put in a few chargers here and there. But that's a lot easier. So we only have to do the vehicles, and, and, and so, that's why there was a big shift from hydrogen to electricity for that reason. I call it, I'll show you, I have a slide, I call it the fuel du jour phenomenon. Uh, so anyway, there, you know, this was a National Academy study. And it was a couple of years ago, but I'd say in the, uh, for National Academy kind of committees, in other words, kind of consensus groups, they come up with numbers like this. 
where the electric vehicles and fuel and so on tend to be will tend to be more expensive than gasoline vehicles into you know into the foreseeable future. So this is for 2035. They were saying even in 2035, these vehicles are going to cost considerably more. Now, I th I was on this committee and I know where the numbers came from. Um, I think these greatly overstated. I think that there's so much innovation happening that these numbers will come down, but they, they still will be significant. And, and kind of to summarize the, the challenge with batteries is they are just fundamentally expensive. So right now, the batteries cost about $900 per kilowatt. So just keep that $900 in your mind. A, a, a Leaf on Nice has 24 kilowatt hours. So therefore, the battery in the leaf is about twenty that costs about twenty thousand dollars right now, just for the battery. You're not making money, by the way, <laughs> on that car. You can quickly figure out. And even for the the Volt, the GM Volt, which is a plug-in hybrid, um, it's so they have sixteen kilowatt hours. So you know they're they're well over well over ten thousand dollars just for the battery in that Volt. Well, the costs are coming down a lot, partly because the batteries are getting better, partly because the car companies are really good at manufacturing and packaging. And this has never happened before, where they've actually gotten their engineers down and figured out, you know, how do you put all this together in a system? You know, and so there's numbers, I mean, the really, really aggressive numbers are, they can bring it down to $150 per kilowatt hour. I think that's way too low, probably lower than it's likely to happen at least for a very long time. But even if it were, the battery in the leaf would still cost $3,600 just for the battery and for the bulb, you know, $2,400. So these are big premiums. And that's what the car industry looks at. And they say, you know, it's hard to really see, you know, towards this future if we're going to use batteries in a big way in conventional vehicles. So one of the obvious um, thoughts on this is, well, me, maybe we need to come up with a more differentiated set of vehicles, use them in different ways. You know, right now we have a transportation system where every vehicle is designed to serve every purpose, you know, more or less. So, you, you know, all vehicles go on all roads, they all, almost all seat at least four people, they all have high performance, they all meet very aggressive safety standards, but, you know, one idea, maybe we need a system where we have small vehicles that are used as neighborhood vehicles. I saw a few little electric uh, uh, gems going around the campus here that are used just for local traffic. You know, maybe we need to come up with more just for engine. So these are cars that General Motors prototypes have put out. They actually have gyroscopes in them, like a Segway, or two-wheel. And um, you know, Larry Burns, who, who was the recent... I want to turn out all the lights. Yeah, and then everyone will fall asleep. Mm -hmm. right. Larry Burns, who used to, was recently VP of R&D for General Motors, has been a strong advocate of this. He did a book with an MIT professor, Bill Mitchell, all about you know, small vehicles connected up and so on. So this is kind of a, a vision of the future. And it's probably a vision that's more relevant to China and India and other places in Europe than U.S. Because you know, what is the market for small vehicles? How much effort are we really going to put into transforming our roads and cities? I mean, we have so much sprawl. We have so much infrastructure. It's unlikely there's going to be a huge market for this. But it, you know, there are niches and opportunities. So I'm going to get to the fuels, and I'm probably talking way too much already. Um, so let me go a little, a little faster. So fuels. I like this quote, you know, a long time uh, head of uh, oil for Saudi Arabia, and and I think it's very true. I think it's very true because those of us that follow, you know, the, the oil reserves and the fossil energy reserve, they're just mammoth. There's so much fossil energy on this planet, on this earth, that if we wanted to use it all, we'll figure out a way, and it could last us for many, many hundreds of years. But a lot of it is very high carbon. High carbon in terms of uh, getting it, having to get it out of the ground, and, and also in terms of processing. So at some point, 
probably pretty soon, we're possibly at that inflection point right now, where we're going to say, okay, you know, we really are committed to lower carbon options and fuels. So this is what I call the fuel de jure phenomena. We did 30 years ago in Jimmy Carter's administration, we did Synfuels, now known as unconventional oil. And then it was methanol. So each of these, I'm going to go through, came, got hyped. The media loved it. The politicians loved it. But they hyped it so much that inevitably expectations couldn't be met. And so then it came crashing down and largely disappeared. Methanol, battery EVs in the early 90s, same thing happened. Hydrogen fuel cells, same thing happened. So ethanol is a little different story because corn ethanol did thrive, but at you know, five or six or seven years ago, people thought this was the fuel of the future, one of the most important fuel. And now it's widely recognized that that's not true, that there are huge downsides to it, um, especially made in certain ways from corn, for instance. And now we're back to electricity again, and the question is, what's next? And what I would argue, without policy, without policy intervention, of course, we would go right back to the top and start all over again. Because there's one simple explanation of why that is, I mean, in addition to you know, the hyping and so on, and that is the oil industry, which is the industry that has all of the financial capital to be able to do the innovation and make the investments in the energy sector. Their core competence is they're really big engineering companies. They bring a lot of capital together. They build big facilities. They're not good at biofuels, which is very diffuse, diffuse and small scale. They're never going to go into biofuels in a really major way, in my opinion. Um, they're doing it as a contingency strategy right now. And, and they'll invest in it, and they'll license it. They're not going to do it. What they're going to do is unconventional oil. You know, oil shale, the shale oils, the oil shales, the uh, tar sands, the you know, oil sands, the heavy oils, the Arctic oil. This is what um, this is what they will invest in if left alone. And they're not being left alone, and so they're not fully investing in that. And now many of them are turning to natural gas, and a big part of the reason is because because of the carbon. Issues. So that's a whole other storyline we can uh, uh, get into if you're interested. So the biofuels story is uh, a very interesting one. Uh, you know, it's a it's a issue of how how uh, interest groups, and stakeholders, can have a big influence in Washington. They got through this very aggressive biofuels program in 2007, and it had this is the requirement for corn ethanol. So it ramps up quickly. And then there's the advanced biofuels. So guess what's happened? We have ramped up under corn ethanol, and this is not happening. Um, in fact, this is supposed to be a mandate. This is supposed to be a requirement. But um, what EPA has done, who's in charge of this, has said, oh gosh, it looks like the investment's not happening. I guess the technology's not ready. We're going to have to give a waiver to the oil industry so they don't have to do it because they can't. It's not happening. And so what's really happened is the oil industry played chicken with EPA, and EPA folded. And now, once you fold once, you know it's very hard to convince anyone that you're serious. So in many ways, and, and so these investments are not happening in a major way. Um, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of R&D, but the commercial investments are made. And that's why what California is doing is becoming so central to this uh, whole issue. OK, uh, so before I get to California, so there was just a National Academy study that just came out and, and said the US is unlikely to meet future biofuel mandates in the absence of major technological innovation and policy changes. Well, I wouldn't say policy change if they just enforced the policy, you know, rule, then you know we things see things happening where you know in a different way. And if you're a policy wonk, you'll start thinking about okay, maybe the rule, the way the, the policy is designed, 
was designed to fail. So maybe there, you can come up with alternative compliance paths and methods that would have given EPA a little more flexibility and let them still enforce it, but in a, in a slightly different way. But we didn't, they haven't, and so, and so you come up with you know, statements like that. So what California has done is it has a low carbon fuel standard, um, which I think is a far better policy. It's far better in the sense that it's performance based, it's market based because it allows trading of credits so and you can't meet the requirement you can buy credits from someone else. It's not just biofuels, but it's all transportation fuels. So it doesn't tell industry, the oil industry, what to do. It just gives them a target. So the target is 10% reduction in carbon intensity by 2020. And now the oil industry is focusing on California because you know they're going to see if California is going to blink. And you know, at least to the extent that I have any influence on this, I keep saying over and over again to our staff and to our board is we cannot even give a hint that we're going to blink because that's going to cause investment to dry up because the industry will say, well, they're going to blame. So we don't really have to make these investments because we're going to be able to get away with it one way or the other. So that's where there's a lot of tension. There's lawsuits and a lot of stuff going on right now. All right, so let me move on. We can come back to low carbon fuel standard. I think it's one of the most important policies that, that's you know, under consideration. California has adopted it. The European Union has adopted it in a slightly different but similar fashion. British Columbia has adopted it. The northeastern states are um, seriously considering it. States of Washington and Oregon also. I'm heading up a national study on the low carbon fuel standard uh, to figure out how to adopt it nationally. So we're working with a lot of, you know, we'll have a series of reports and papers coming out uh, in the next few months. Uh, we're going to begin laying that out. So we're trying to you know, create the scientific inputs to it and provide, you know, what we're trying to avoid is what happened with cap and trade in Washington, where there was no template, there was no uh, structured design from the beginning, so it just became political and everyone was getting bought off, uh, you know, in different ways and the whole thing kind of fell on it, you know, its own weight in the end. My simple, simple uh, <laughs> assessment of what happened. So in California, I mean, so the low carbon fuel standards template, you put the template out there, the design, the basic structure, and then at least people know what they're arguing about, and they have something to respond to and build on that has some kind of scientific performance-based, market-based structure to it. So the third leg, this is more my proselytizing because I don't, I think there's only one of you working, I don't know, I don't know if there's many of you working on transportation, the mobility side of it. Uh, but as Richard said, you, you know, this is, this is part of it. And, and as I said, um, the carbon reductions are probably not going to be that great, although if you go to the NGO world, they'll argue, you know, this is fundamentally important, big piece of the climate uh, policy, climate challenges, reducing vehicle miles traveled. Um, but there are lots of reasons why it is important. And it's because of all these, uh, all the so-called co-benefits that I mentioned earlier. So this is my Washington, D.C. slide. And that is my go to Washington. You know, that's what I said earlier. They have the politicians, many politicians have this idea in their mind that Americans have a right to travel. And if you introduce any policy or law that even hints at restricting people's ability to to have a car and drive, then you're undermining a basic American right. So I said, well, you know, there are some cases where maybe those trips aren't that important. In fact, if that person got out of the car and walked, they would be healthier, they'd use less energy, and we'd all be better off. But, okay. so, so this is a law, so California passed the law three years ago, and the Air, Air Resources Board on board is responsible for administering it. So the way we're, and the, the law just said that, it was called the Sustainable Communities Act, and it said that greenhouse gases from transportation needed to be reduced um, by addressing sprawl and land use. 
So we came up with targets. Every metropolitan, all the major metropolitan targets have to reduce, or the target is for them to reduce the vehicle miles traveled per capita by six, seven to eight percent. Each one has a slightly different number. Um, and then in 2035, 13 to 16 percent per capita. And it's actually, if you look at it, it's really reduction in, not in VMT, but in greenhouse gases per capita uh, for travel, controlling for vehicle technology and fuels. So it really comes down to VMT and any man, you know, system management, some system management. The problem with that, so I think it's a great law, great policy. In fact, there's a lot of discussion about how to migrate this into the, the national law, the National Transportation Act reauthorization, um, because what it really just says is we should do this in a performance-based way. And this is good policy, right? We should have, we should be distributing transportation financing and funding to the states and, and cities based on performance. And right now we tend to give it, if they have more vehicle use and more vehicles and more roads, we give them more money. Here's a revolutionary idea. What about if they reduce their vehicle use? They, would they get more money? Should they get more money? So, you know, kind of a revolutionary idea, but that's the kind of idea we're looking at is making it more performance based. Um, but the way it is, so it gives every metropolitan area a target. It says we're not going to tell you what to do. We're just saying you got to do it. You can use pricing, road pricing, parking pricing. Uh, you can improve your public transportation, you can manage land use better, do what you want to do, but these are your targets. The problem right now is, you know, cities are broke, and so you need to basically bribe them. You know, you can't use sticks with the cities because they don't have any, you know, you know it's getting blood out of turn. Uh, and so you need to have some kind of revenue stream to them to reward them. And that's what we're going so one of the goals, what I hope is, the cap and trade program we adopt in California will take some of those revenues and give them to the cities as rewards for meeting these targets. But Mary's giving allowances away for free. What's that? But the cap and trade program gives most of the allowances away for free. Right? Well, you know that's that's kind of the media take on it, and if and, and it's sort of true in the beginning. But those um, allow that process is going to change pretty quickly. So, for instance, in 2015, they're going to all the oil companies are going to be required to um, buy allowances for the carbon content of their fuels. Now, there's not much they can do about it, and even if they could, they wouldn't do it. So, they're just going to start buying allowances. So, that's going to generate a lot. Of, that's going to generate billions of dollars a year by itself if we can sure that stays stuck. Um, and, and a lot of those, you know, the, a lot of those free allowances are going to disappear over the years. So yeah, it's not, you know, yes, next year that's true. But by 2015, I don't think that's true. I think there's going to be a lot of revenue starting to be generated. The problem with the cap and trade is, you know, us, ARB, adopted all the rules, but now the legislature is going to decide, decide what to do with the money. And, you know, you can imagine that makes you a little nervous because the first inclination will be to pay off, you know, will be used to balance the budget and, and, and just put it into general revenue. We'd like it to be used in a much more useful way that's going to have be much more effective. So anyway, so this is the greenhouse. So this is all the things California's done. Back to 2002 with vehicle standards. This is 2006, the broad top law that was passed that's the overarching law for everything. This is the one about reducing sprawl and vehicle use, the low carbon fuel standard. Cap and trade was actually first adopted in 2010, is just now been finalized. A law requiring 33% renewable new standards for vehicles. And this is really an extra, I mean it's, I think it's extraordinary what California's done. And it's kind of, one of the things is, how much of an outlier is California and how is it unique in some way? And I'll come back to that in a, in a second. It's a big outlier. <laughs> we'll uh, uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> I'm going to argue it's a little out. Okay. Uh, and this is for the economists in the crowd. Um, that 
know, here we argue with all this aggressive policy, and in fact, a lot of <coughs> regulatory based, not market based. You know, I tend to be, I am a proponent of making it, if it's regulatory, make it performance based, and then use as much market instruments as possible within the constraints you're operating in. But if you look at the transportation sector in particular, there are so many market conditions. You know, I sometimes call them market failures, and my economist friends kind of push back and they say, well, many of these are market conditions, not market failures. Okay, I'll, I'll go along with that. But anyway, there's all of these things that lead to underinvestment, lack of innovation uh, in vehicles, fuels, and mobility. And any of these could be a good PhD dissertation. How powerful do you think the lock in effect is? Because you mentioned that earlier. Yeah. Is it a, sort of a QWERTY, beta, VHS equivalent, you think, for internal combustion engines? Or? Well, there's lock in because we have so many, in different sectors, it's different. So in the vehicle area, I think it's starting to change. But you know, it's taken decades, right? So it depends how you define lock in and what time periods and dynamics. But on the but on the urban mobility side, we have so many, that's where I said we have so little innovation. You know, I, I'm sitting next to Silicon Valley and I have these venture capitalists come to me all the time and they say, wow, there's this huge market for us to do all kinds of creative things. And within six months, you know, they've given up. And it's just because you have uh, situations where you have for instance, you have taxi monopolies that are resistant to competition. You have the transit agencies that are essentially monopolies that don't have resources, that have been starved for so long, don't know how to be creative anymore, and on top of that are resistant to competition also. And, and then you've got all the rule, you know, how land use management happens and the role of developers. It's really hard on, on, on that, on the city scale. But on the industry, and the oil industry, you know, the, the, with the fuels part of it, the oil industry really calls the shots, at least certainly from a financial perspective. Like biofuels, the reason biofuels is not happening in my mind is because there's no constituents, there's no economic constituency for it. You know, they put the money in to make it happen. The ag industry is very diffuse. You've got a few big companies like ADM and Cargill, and they're putting a little money in it, but even those are, they're tiny companies oil companies. So it's the big oil companies that have all the money, and if they don't invest in it, it ain't going to happen, unless you have a very aggressive policy that makes them do that. So anyway, okay, so this is basically summarizing everything I've been talking about. And, and this is the model. I guess the big, one of the big insights I've gained the last few years is that even though many of us are strong believers in market instruments, and we say, just get a carbon tax in place and all the good things will happen. At least in the transportation sector, the, mark, the pure market instruments play a very small role under any scenario, under any circumstance. And that is because um, there's so much inelasticity both on the consumer side and on the supplier side. And you can explain that in you know, that long list of market conditions and failures helps explain a lot of it. But we know, so there's been criticisms of the low carbon fuel standard, for instance. One of my colleagues was one of the leading uh, critics of it, or at least, you know, analytically critical of it. And he said that if you do a carbon tax, it'll be far more efficient, economically efficient. And he was right. But the tax, that, a carbon tax that you would need to get the same effect as a low carbon fuel standard would be a 15 or $20 a gallon tax. There's no way we're going to get a $15, $15 or $20 carbon tax in place. So if we really want change, we need these regulatory instruments. But the challenge, I think, is to make them as performance-based and have market components to it. But in the end, the pure market instruments play a very minor role uh, in the transformation of the transportation sector and in reducing greenhouse gases. And then there's all kinds of, you know, those are some of the policy wonks here, we could get into a lot of these issues and you know, maybe in some other discussions we can do that. Because um, there's so many issues. Uh, yes? Okay, on, the, on that last point, um, so I mean I guess if you were 
you know, I'll, I'll step in on that conversation that you have with the economists on this, I guess. <laughs> so they, they might retort back, well, that's fine. I mean, if society's valued, say, that CO2 reduction should be worth $20, and you're spending 125 to achieve some other objective, are you doing the right thing? And so I guess that, that puts the onus on saying, well, it's not just carbon, it's all these other things. And how does the rest of that conversation go? Well, part of it is, you know, the so-called co-benefits is part of it. There's energy security benefits, for instance, and, and all the other benefits that come come along with it. The other is just that there's these market, you know, market conditions and market failures that are uh, reducing investment, reducing R and D, reducing innovation, and discouraging uh, and discouraging all of those. And so. That's what you're doing with the regulatory insurance, and that's what you're doing with the zero emission vehicle program. Is you're you're getting the attention of industry and saying, okay, industry, you know, the lock, you know, because of lock-in, because of inertia, because of corporate cultures, there, it's difficult for them to change direction. Even though, so the fuel economy standards are a good example of that. We've no, the economists have shown that the return. Uh, of efficiency is huge to society and even to consumers, but the consumers per behave in a way that they expect the returns uh, for buying a more fuel efficient vehicle. They, the amount of money they pay, they want that, the benefits back, the return on that within about two years or so. Now that doesn't make sense at all from a societal perspective, and actually for individuals it usually doesn't either. And, and there's lots of ways of explaining that behavior. So, you know, I think when you go through each piece of this, you find a good rationale for these interventionist strategies. The problem with that, and now I, I recognize this now being a regulator, is now you're trusting the regulators to get this right. And, and that, can, that should make you nervous. And the challenge, therefore, is so there's this whole set of Instrument, regulatory instruments, connected with policy, connected with market instruments, and voluntaries, and actions, and incentives, and you're trying to put it all together to send consistent signals, so that you're not work. None of these are working cross purposes, because what we're ending up with, and this is the overall message here, folks, is that we're going to need a vast set of policy instruments if we're expecting to have large reductions energy use, and greenhouse gases. And how do we do that? And so we're going to need some very smart people in government. You know, that's one piece of this. A lot of engagement with stakeholders to get this right. There's lots of ways to screw up. There's no doubt about it. You heard about uh, two-way trade in ethanol between the United States and Brazil. Yeah, and that's the purpose of complying with the LCFS. What do you think? With the RFS. So that's the federal problem. Uh, it will be the California one also as it gets in place. Yeah, so that's an example where um, we're selling corn ethanol to Brazil, and Brazil is selling, you know, sugar ethanol, which is, you know, the same thing, just made in different ways to us, just a shuffling. And, you know, it's, a, it's because uh, of the requirements that, you know, we've imposed for carbon reductions and, and, and Brazil needs more, it's not produced. Brazil is actually shifting its sugarcane production to sugar because that's getting a high price. So it's creating a, a you know, this, you know, this problem here of, you know, shuffling and leakage. And we've got to figure, that, I mean, that's, that's an inherent problem in, in all of these climate policies. And we're going to have to get more clever about how to, how to, you know, reduce that leakage as much as possible. For California, it's a big problem because California is just one place, and you know now there's going to be leakage and shuffling within the U.S. as well as internationally, and we have to figure out a way to minimize that as much as possible. Of course, the best would be if, California, if the U.S. just adopted the, the same requirements. Um, but this is going to be a, a continuing challenge, and the oil sands is another example. And that's where the big debate is right now. Is um, do we impose carbon restrictions on the oil shale? And if, I, I mean, the oil sands from Canada, 
if we do, they argue, well, they'll just send it to China, and you know, and, and in the end, we're actually worse off because of all the extra transportation costs to get it to China and then swap it. So that's the. But isn't that the major? I mean, it, for for transportation, if you think about the different ways of complying with something like the LCFS, um, unless you bring electrification into it in a significant way, it really is about moving toward less carbon-intensive petroleum sources or moving to ethanol with different levels of carbon intensity. And so, I guess I actually see it as kind of a major, not just a challenge, but like a major problem. Because we live in a global liquids market, and stuff can shift around very easily within the U.S. and pretty easily globally. So how do you how do you deal with that? This is like a major issue. Okay, so an observation that would um, on the other side of that is that so I talk a lot with the oil companies, with senior management, and a number of the oil companies, and they have told me privately that the LCFS has dramatically changed their attitude toward investments. And they now look at investments in high carbon energy sources. And they, one, what they do is they're all, they're all applying a shadow price of carbon. So Shell has actually announced this publicly. So they now use a $40 per ton price. They apply it when they're doing their, you know, their uh, investment analysis of what they should invest in. And I've been told that they will not invest in anything in, in, in anything anymore if they think it's really going to be a long-term high carbon stream. So with the oil sands, like, like Shell with the oil sands, they now they are they are implementing cap and trade. I mean, uh, carbon capture and sequestration in their oil sands fields. They are improving the efficiency. They're putting cogeneration into the into the, the mining facilities, and and they say it's. You know, it's resulted in a, in a whole mindset change in how they make investments. Yeah, they were going, they were going for oil shale. I mean, that's kind of like putting a cap on the current level of greenhouse gases and not making it worse, right? I mean, yeah, it's kind of like saying we're not going to develop coal to liquids, which is different from a reduction. I don't know, I think. Well, it's different, but it's but it's that same idea that I think that LCFS has got the attention of industry and is changing their behavior and their thinking. And so it's already had a major effect, even though it's not even been implemented. And so there is the challenge. So they're all, they've got a lot, whole slew of analysts figuring out how to get around any regulation you adopt. They're going to look for loopholes and ways around it. Um, and so that's where the challenge, I think that it's the right, uh, so another way of looking at it, a low carbon fuel standard example is, it's the right way to do it. It's setting a performance standard, using market instruments. And I can't think of any better way to do that if we're going to move towards a lower carbon future. And so then the question becomes, OK, how do we make this work? And there are problems. There is the shuffle problem. But it seems like the right approach. And I think, and so it's easy to criticize. That's the other thing. You know, when you're outside government, when you're an academic, it's easy to criticize anything. Your income but you know the other challenge is how to make it work, and so that's my mission right now. It's and understanding there are downsides. You try to minimize the downsides, and I think you know we're messing around. So in California, the big controversy is how do you create? You know we have high carbon intensity petroleum, so we're creating a whole rule about high carbon intensity. It's it's the most controversial part of the the rule right now. Tell you what happens next month. We're voting. So, one of the challenges with the low carbon fuel standards, and particularly the, the biofuel part of it, is you know, when we think about a standard and we use words like carbon, we think you know immediately it's something we can actually measure in the fuel and say it's there, it's not. Think about diesel fuel and sulfur and stuff like that. And low carbon fuels, again, particularly with biofuels, the big issue there is. In, indirect land use change, and particularly if you talk about international land use change, that's been sort of a big, big issue anyway in California. And so it's it's really not so much a matter of the what you can observe in the fuel, but kind of what you believe about the supply chain in ways that are very difficult to prove um, one way or the other. And so 
that, that's just, I made a comment. I guess that just seems like one of the big challenges on that front, unless you're just kind of take biofuels out and say that's, you know, we no longer believe they're low carbon, let's try everything else, and that might be a little bit easier. I don't know. Okay, so in the academic world, there have been some very cogent uh, critiques of using life cycle analysis, because that's what you're really saying. Life cycle analysis, does it really work? You have to look into all the upstream emissions, and then where it really becomes questionable is then you have indirect effects, like what's so-called indirect land use change effects with biofuels, and then you get into even so when you get into this indirect effect, it's like if you make a big investment in corn ethanol, it perturbs a whole economic system globally, and and that results in different emission characteristics. So. In fact, my academic colleague, Mark DeLucchi, has come up with a very sophisticated criticism of life cycle analysis and shows why it's flawed, which is essentially what you're saying. The problem becomes, again, in the policy world, you got to implement something that's as transparent as possible, as simple as possible, and that works. And uh, we end up, again, with the same situation with it's not intellectually elegant um, and sophisticated, but I think it's the best instrument, we policy mechanism we have using life cycle. And so we have to do a better job of you know, each piece of it. I had Carnegie Mellon people write a whole paper on why the low-carbon fuel standard is a bad idea because of uncertainty. And But if you look at it, there's the question of, there's uncertainty, and then there's precision in how you design the policy instrument. So, um, so that's another whole fun topic. But you're you're exactly right that again, and I think what happens is that you know the bigger issue is when you get into policy, every policy you do has shortcomings, and so you try to figure out which policy has the fewest shortcomings and the fewest flaws, and gets you on the path to where you want to go. But I guess there's a threshold question about whether it's better than nothing. Exactly. It really is. Exactly. It's, and you know, so I would. Anyway. Yeah. So it's a. It's the if right. It, if it doesn't have a, even if it's the best you can do, if it doesn't have effect, or if it has right. unintended perverse effects that actually make it worse than doing nothing, then you kind of have to step back. Right. That's exactly right. And so that's the analysis you have to do is try to figure out um, when that's the case. Are you moving in the right direction, or are you not? And. Good modeling helps, <laughs> but wisdom also helps in trying to figure that out because a lot of this can't be modeled very well, either because the science is not well established, the models are not very sophisticated, they don't have enough behavior in them, either on an organization behavior or on a consumer side, and, and we just don't understand things as well as we'd like to. University.